Okay, let's do this. How's the transmission? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Excellent. Thank you for confirming. Um, welcome to a third instance on Theater Sound. Uh, we have a super guest today, so um, let's get quickly over the household notes, and then my co-host, John Manito, will take the honors of introducing today's special guest. Thanks, bro. Yeah, excellent. Welcome, John. So um, today, special guest, Jonathan Deans. I will leave the introductions to John. Uh, that means that it's my duty today to explain you temporarily briefly about the uh, Zoom communication platform that we use to conduct these webinars. Um, in front of you, you have a window, not unlike the one you see over here. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions, but in order to do so, you need to make use of the participants and chat functionality. Whenever you click on participants, you see who else is joining you today on the session. Um, and like I said, we encourage you to ask questions, uh, but in order to do so in an organized fashion, please make use of the raise hand button. Whenever you click that button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, informing me that you're about to ask a question. At what time I was trying to find a, a white space in the narrative of our guest lecture and co-host and, uh, and temporarily interrupt them to pose your question. Now, in order to ask the question itself, we would like you to make use of the chat feature. So whenever you click on the balloon icon, the chat balloon icon, that is the right hand window splits in half, uh, bringing up a chat dialogue. <clears throat> There's a field at the bottom where you can enter a message and you can address it to everyone on the call. But if you happen to see a fellow colleague, family member or friend, you can also address that person in private. Um, like I said before, you know, we're simulcasting as we speak. So those that are joining us uh, through the Meyer Sound user community Facebook group, welcome to you as well. This group is growing at a steady pace, currently counting over 8,900 members. A uh, welcome to you as well. And um, like I mentioned before, we have done several webinars by now uh, in the interest of theater sound. Um, all of those can be found on our Thinking Sound YouTube channel to which you see all relevant information uh, in front of you. This is where the previous webinars on Theater Sound and many more uh, can be found. Goes without saying that today's webinar will also be found uh, upon conclusion within a couple of hours on that same YouTube channel. Um, today we're gonna see again uh, a handful of examples that all make use of the Precision Toolset, which is our turnkey solution for design all the way to deployment. Uh, we've talked about that at great length. So uh, without further ado, please allow me to introduce my co-host for the third time in a row. Welcome, John. Thank you, Merlin. It's great to be uh, hosting this week and uh, closing it out with uh, a very special guest, Jonathan Deans. Um, as many of you know, and uh, there's a pretty good group I see out, out on the, you know, in the, in the uh, watch group here, on Zoom. Um, Jonathan has been designing theater for large scale shows um, for Cirque du Soleil and other, other companies through an amazing career. Um, his, he's worked uh, also with very small budget shows um, and regional works to Off-Broadway, West End. Um, and then some shows uh, and some of his budgets have been pretty much off the charts. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, he, I think we're gonna cover a lot of that today. Um, Jonathan has also taught sound design at the university level, um, and some of his associates and mixers that have worked for Jonathan um, have gone on to become designers of their own shows. Uh, his list of credits are extensive uh, in terms of theater, things like Ragtime, Lestat, Taboo, Seussical, uh, to more recently Pippin, Finding Neverland, Waitress, and the, probably the most recent show, which I think is Jagged, um, but I'm sure he's got some others in the works that he'll talk about. Um, so uh, without further ado, I wanted to welcome Jonathan to uh, our, our uh, Friday webinar. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hey, John. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I'm doing good. All this. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Like everyone yeah. else, it's kind of on, on a pause or intermission, whatever, you know? Yeah. So. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's really hitting the theater community hard, and, uh, but uh, we're, we're working through it. And, and these are really fun to do, to uh, look to the future and look at the next steps. Um, so one of my first questions, um, and Jonathan had a little preview of these um, that I sent him yesterday, is, um, you know, I understand there were some acting in your youth. And then what started you down the road of sound design for theater? 
Yeah, and I was going to say that, yes, you sent me some questions. So I was able to like kind of jot a few sort of responses to that. Um, the, um, but the, so if I'm looking this way, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just checking my notes to make sure I'm trying to be <laughs> as honest, as uh, accurate as possible. Um, for, so anyway, uh, what started me down the road, it wasn't actually a road. It was like a landscape. It was the barren. It was nothing there when we started. It was, um, it was really um, the beginning of, of uh, using sound. I mean, compared to what is happening now. Um, in, and I, I'm, I'm basing this all really on uh, kind of uh, the, uh, theatrical productions, uh, and, uh, certainly initially. Um, but uh, because I, you know, I remember going to see Pink Floyd um, uh, do The Wall, uh, Wem Wembley Arena, and so, mm. uh, which was so ahead of its thing. It was just so amazing and so um, um, uh, incredible that it just woke up your senses uh, because they had their speakers. This is not on my list. Uh, they had speakers that uh, were around you and stuff like this, and it was like so thrilling to see see and hear something like that. And I was probably uh, uh, eighteen months old or something. I was so you know not really, but I was just you know just uh, uh, I was yeah yeah just a, a glimmer in, in someone's eye. Um, but anyway, the uh, there was nothing really there, um, and. Uh, but I, I had a, 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 my kind of hobby um, was listening to music, if that's such a thing as a hobby, but also kind of like uh, being able to do, um, I, I got also, it was interesting, kind of electronic stuff and everything else. And then while I was away working as uh, a young a youth uh, actor, um, or, or trying to be anyway, um, um, I uh, met a sound guy who taught me how to wet it um, on tape because um, that's what it was then and uh, so I had great fun kind of scaring the crap out of our Tudors and uh, chaperones and stuff by putting speakers in different places and stuff like that and just uh, and so it was I, I saw the power of sound of how to terrify someone who was trying to teach you um, in a very kind of boyish, youthful way, so it was kind of funny. Um, and so um, I, but I realized, um, I did a show called Absurd Person Singular, this is kind of jumping uh, okay. several years, and Absurd Person Singular is a play by Alan Aitborn, and it was a, uh, in a theater, and I'd watch these actors, I'd be on the side of the stage, and I was uh, working on Autograph's very first show, Autograph mm. Sound, which is a sound company wow. in, uh, in London. Uh, I know you know, but I'm saying that yeah. globally. Um, the, um, it, it, and they could, it was interesting. They, it was two reboxes, two tape machines, a little switcher box to switch from one to the other, and uh, two speakers. We actually needed like four, so I'd have to push them around in between queues to the different locations, but they couldn't afford uh, to buy any more speakers and certainly the production didn't want to pay it. So uh, I sat and did that show for uh, probably close to, um, I think it was like 18 months, 15 months. I wrote down 15 months. I did mm -hmm. uh, sitting on the side of the stage, what, what, watching actors come on and off and I would have to trigger uh, different party sounds as they go in and out of their different parties, um, you know, events that they would be having. And just watching those actors come on and off and I was like, I am not that. I am not, I cannot. It was so unbelievable just understanding the real actor. I, I, had, I had had the pleasure also of working with the Royal Shakespeare Company as a young actor. And again, just watching them in rehearsal and thing, it was just astounding. I was like, oh, how, how to do that, how to be that, and just this huge respect and just how void I am of that talent. Um, mm. So I, um, and there I was playing sound effects for these actors and I realized that I could actually change their laugh of entrance and exit depending on where I was on the tape. And so I started, <laughs> started understanding how sound, and in this case, me choosing the right kind of moments in the long running tape uh, to get the best effect 
uh, and how could how that would affect an audience. And so uh, that was my initial, I think, my initial uh, feel of, of that uh, connection. Um, in between, around that time as well, when I was, um, I also decided to try and get a job in a recording studio. So I went into a recording. I, I got a, a, a couple of jobs in, in recording studios over a, a, an expense of a couple of years, uh, two, three years. And, um, and in fact, one of the studios I was in, which was worked in as an assistant um, engineer or tape op at the time, uh, assistant engineer, the, uh, one of the other tape ops was Martin Levan. Uh, mm -hmm. who's also a well-known sound designer and um, he was elevated to uh, be an engineer uh, while I was there actually and uh, so I actually tape opt for Martin uh, as well as all the people before that so uh, that was and Martin was thing. mixing or he was uh... no he, he started off as a tape op the same he, well he was a okay. tape op the same as me but he became a mixer uh, in the he became an engineer which is doing you know working with the producers directly um, while I was there. Um, and the studio that we were in all used Kadak um, mm -hmm. mixers. So mixing consoles. So um, nice. yeah, it's just an interesting thing, you know, side thing. So, uh, so yeah, so that's how I kind of uh, sort of got into it in a, in a, a, a decent enough way to explain for so that's probably one of my questions is what show changed your life was it was it the wall or was it uh watching <laughs> well, these actors I, and doing sound effects or i i i can get rid of this one so i i i didn't <laughs> I, I, I didn't i didn't realize that the that the war i didn't realize about the war until uh this came up uh i'm uh, yeah because uh as a number of people know me i will kind of uh, I, i'm pretty much focused, but there is, I don't know, there's a lot of experiences that I have been, uh, uh, I, I guess the word is blessed to have, and mm -hmm. a lot of people I've been involved with that have just been uh, so shaping my world. So when you ask what kind of show, you know, what was there a show that changed your life? I have a list, I have actually had a list of 18 of them. Wow, um, okay. Because if I was to say one show, there would be no shows. It would be the show that I'm on, whatever that show is right now. And in yeah. fact, right now it's this show. So, so <laughs> this is the webinar. So, um, but I, I would say absurd person singular. I'm just going to rattle through them, I guess, and you can stop me. Yeah, great. Um, no. A, a chorus line. A chorus line was a major oh, thing. Wow. It's also wow. where I met Abe Jacob and Ox uh -huh. Mandelow. Uh, but Abe Jacob, who really is my mentor, uh, he, I, I did a chorus line with him. This was in London when the production came to London with an American cast. It was uh, it certainly changed everything in my life. Uh, right. I mean, What's funny it, is that, you know, for Tony Miola, he had the same comment about that show. Yeah, it that was, was. That was the show. Yeah, it, really. That's, that's awesome. That's what I should. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, I mean, just going through the thoughts and the memories and stuff like that. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Tony took over from me because I, when I, after mixing in England, um, I was lucky enough to be invited to try and uh, to do the show in America if I could work out how to work there and, and do, do uh, you know, get the permits, or, you know, uh, visas and everything else. So I was asked, and so, um, and when I left, to go and do a Vida um, um, back in London, um, Tony Miola took over for me. So oh. that was, yeah, so that's, again, there's a kind of weird ties for those of you that actually give a shit about that. Um, so, um, and then uh, Vida Cats. Cats was, uh, I, I put down Cats just because of the Abe connection there of how that goes. Um, I, my first sound design was a show called Marilyn in London, based on Marilyn Monroe. Um, I did a play called The Real Thing. I did a production called Time, uh, which at the moment, at that time was kind of ahead of its thing. We had a so-called hologram of Laurence Olivier. Uh, it wasn't a hologram, it was a projection on a 3D service, but it looked very hologram-ish. 
Um, uh, Le Miserable did 14 productions of that. I didn't do the original, mm. that was Andrew Bruce. And then um, Andrew Bruce, who ran Autograph Sound. Uh, I have to say this, uh, not have to say this, I need to say this, that uh, after Absurd Person Singular and Autograph Sound, I kind of, and that was a, a company that was going to rent gear and do things, and they were expanding and stuff. And um, uh, they did Chorus Line. I got to know them and stuff like this, and I became a part of Autograph Sound. Uh, and I think I worked with them for like 16 years. So in amongst all of doing shows at night, and then um, mix, a, a mix, I was a mixer for you know so many number of years, so many years, and then I, my first sound design was Marilyn, um, and then Real Thing, I play Time, Le Miserable. I kind of took over that for Andrew, who had to run a company, and I did, uh, as I said, fourteen productions, and then. Um, then I, um, uh, I, I had also uh, worked at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden. Uh, I had mm. worked there for a couple of years. Um, mm. And that was, that was amazing to sit in the sound box, which was over on the side of the uh, auditorium, which overlooked this huge, beautiful orchestra pit. Sitting in there, listening to opera, ballet, and that sound coming up, I, that was, it was like uh, having a bath in whatever would excite you and please you to have a bath in. But that's what it was like <laughs> every day, every day, because it would be her rehearsals in the day. It was just unbelievable, uh, just an amazing uh, thing to understand that whatever we're doing as sound designers is nothing like what the natural acoustic sound of or, or certainly of me sitting hovering above an open you know orchestra of mm -hmm. 60 to 100 musicians depending on the piece um just enthralling so that was a a, 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 a sonic uh, moment um i then jumping into the us i uh siegfried and roy i did the show siegfried and roy right. at the mirage yeah um that was the, they had seen a, the show called Time, and uh, they said, oh, you know, this is what we want, and so that's what they got. Uh, they, got the, they got the team from uh, Time to, uh, to do the Secret and Roy, basically. Uh, and, yeah. And then... Um, that was your, your first Las Vegas show. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. And at the time, it was, uh, the Mirage wasn't built, because uh, that's where we were inside, and it hadn't opened, it was, you know, I guess being built. But it was just uh, uh, maybe three or four buffets, um, and a couple of restaurants that were, you know, uh, relatively expensive, and that was it. It was just uh, really pretty... Um, um, empty. It was quite interesting, um, and certainly the. Uh, it's like <clears throat> from from. The, I, I worked at. Um, I was doing work at Universal Studios as well. I was living in LA at the time. You know the yeah. capital of theatre, <clears throat> um, and uh, joke. And uh, Universal Studios was really interesting because that's where I went and learnt about uh, time code, show control, and. I just could I see all these uh, uh, devices that were triggering shows automatically, whether it be a ride or whether it be a live show. And uh, even with live mics, how that was being triggered. So it was a, a, a huge, huge thing for me there because that triggered me to uh, work on uh, level control systems. As right. people might know it now, uh, LCS. Um, and that's when I started developing those thoughts to that and started meeting the people that then became the team for uh, level control systems. So that's how Steve that Ellison, yeah. Yeah, Steve yeah. Ellison was my first person. And he happened, yeah. to, he happened to be moving to, uh, you know, like 15 minutes away from where I live, from the Boston area, um, by coincidence, because I was talking to him because I was using Max. Max patches, and you could buy Max patches from people, and he happened to have one. It was interesting, so I bought one. I think I was the only person who bought his patch. Um, 
Mm. Uh, and um, I can't even quite remember what the patch was. I'm sure he does, um, uh, just because he remembers everything. Yeah, um, he does. He, um, so yeah, so uh, that's how that came about. It's funny how these things, you trip on things, you come across things and you go, oh, yeah. I'm gonna do it. And you trip up, it's like, oh, I'm gonna do this and everything else. And it's like when I started working with Cirque du Soleil, all of my uh, Broadway or theater friends started laughing. Oh my God, he's going to run away with the circus. Uh, and it's in Montreal and they're in the middle of the snow. And you no, know, because it was at that time when it was like, uh, you know, it's the same when I started doing a show in Vegas. Vegas is doing another show in Vegas. He's going to do a show called EFX in Vegas. It's like, oh my God, this, you know, so it's just one of those things that happen. And so I'm saying that just so that you never know what's around the corner. You never right. know what happens. You're working for a company where suddenly you're helping build in the sets and loading the trucks and unloading the trucks and in three foot of snow, so to say. And where, where one of the, the, the major bosses are, are taking you and picking you up from the, yeah, from the airport, you know, um, because it was, you know, just a very small company that became something you never know. So that's what I'm saying. Wow. I'm, that's why I say this, because it's, it's, <clears throat> it's fun to say, fun to say um, yes to say yes to things. And that's why at right. the beginning you said you've done small things to big things. And it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's amazing how many small things become big. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, for us, it's exciting because uh, we're about to release Space Map Go. And that's kind of, that's the evolution of LCS, right? It's one of the evolutions of LCS. I have yet is, to see. I have yet to see. So I, I, I thought I, Steve gave you a preview, he said. Uh, he, he gave me an unofficial look and everything else. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's the preview. I mean, I can show you some things here. I can give you a preview of something, but it has nothing to do with the reality. So yeah. let's see the reality and, you know, keep that in, in mind. And uh, is yeah, everyone... It's, it's pretty close, uh, ready for prime time. When is that being released? Do, do, do you know? Uh, I think we're, we're, it's going to be August now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. Can't wait to see that. Um, so um, anyway, so I did uh, so that talk about... It's not a show, but it's a company that you suddenly uh, are just doing all these amazing things. And what's beautiful about that show is um, the uh, the owner uh, or the past owner, uh, Guy La Liberty, um, he is a big fan of sound. He understands sound mm -hmm. and he, in the same way that he, uh, uh, is the word respects or, 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 or gets it, he then demands. There's a demand that goes with that. When anyone that you come across, a director or producer who really understands sound, therefore their demand is going to be so much greater and their questions are so much deeper. And so you better have your, your, uh, your gun belt full of all your tools and everything else, or tool belt, I should say, rather than gun belt, that's terrible. Um, yeah. So you should have, so because you never, there's, one should never try and, uh, pretend to do something or do a, what do they call a snow job or something and just, you know, mm -hmm. just, um, you, can, you, can, you cannot do that in, in our world. You could try, but you're gonna fail. Um, so, uh, and when you come across, and when the boss, uh, the, in this person, the, the owner of a Cirque yeah. has a question uh, and is paying attention to sound, everybody, pays attention to sound. So where, what kind of uh, system you're going to design, how you're going to use it, why you can't put a piece of plywood in front of the speaker, why that would make a difference to the listener, um, which are conversations that go on all the time when we're doing uh, other shows. Um, you know, it's like, what do you mean I, I can't put, you know, a bunch of scenery in front of the speaker? Uh, it's like, I can still hear it. <laughs> So, um, so all, all of those shows and uh, you can trigger or ask questions about that um, uh, or a particular one or if anyone wants to ask questions as, as they go. Um, are we going to save the questions to the end? We, we do. Yeah, we have all the, those, um, a lot of the drawings and images that you, uh, you had sent us too um, on some of the recent work that you're working on. Okay. Um, 
I'll, I'll just uh, ragtime, pirate queen, pippin, waitress, and then uh, you can, if you like, want to show. Um, a so board. we have drawn to life on the on the screen right now. Well, okay. I don't know if you see um, it. So that's up on the screen. Yeah, do you see, do you see the... Um, I do what's... now, I do now. I okay, do, there we go. It was hidden by you. Ah, I was looking at, I was looking at sorry. you. I was, having, I was having a conversation with you, which was... Uh, <laughs> I was forgetting that there was... Uh, um, Merlin's been throwing up pictures of Andrew Bruce and, you know, and oh, Dave. Andrew, and, Andrew. Yeah. yeah, Andrew Bruce, uh, another iconic person um, in my world, um, just of uh, how all that... Ha uh, the connection of the history and uh, just uh, 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 amazing um, individual and uh, a fantastic uh, company that he runs the yeah. way he runs. So this is Drawn to Life. Thank you. Yes, move me along. Um, uh, Drawn to Life. Uh, Drawn to Life was the show. We were like five, six days away from opening the show when everything was locked down. So uh, this is what I was doing. In fact, I think the shows that I... Orlando, right? Yes, in Orlando. The shows that I gave you were the shows that I've done last year. They're all last year shows, um, minus um, Waitress that I've done in London. But um, so Drawn to Life, Drawn to Life was replacing Lanuba. Um, and it was one of those things where it was um, uh, using the Disney IP um, with Cirque. And so it was based on uh, animation. So they, they, they took this idea and based it on the animators and drawing things. And it is a, a super cool, a really super cool show. It's um, just the, the designers and the composer, Benoit Jutra, uh, who uh, did uh, O and Lanuba and Kudam and uh, many other shows that I, I can't think of right now. Um, just awesome for he and I to uh, uh, get together and work uh, on this. And when it's when I say he and I, it sounds like oh, there's two of us. Um, the, with uh, I need to stress that when I'm working and certainly doing shows of this size, there's always a team. The team uh, is either. Um, uh, larger on some shows and smaller on others, but uh, we have, you know, my associate Brian Shea, who's who's working with me on this, who also does the programming, uh, uh, along with uh, Rob Mealy, who uh, is working on this, um, uh, and he's looking after all the networks and everything else in the theatre, which is a fascinating story on its own. But um, yeah. then uh, Dave Wallace, who is the front of house mixer, just Brilliant. Actually, actually, there's four Daves in the com in, in, in the department. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, the whole the whole thing. I, I the just the, the teamwork. It's again when you go to try to do something like this. It's a collaboration and, mm -hmm. and teamwork. It's critical. Um, otherwise, you can, you will not be able to get out of bed if you don't have something interesting to look forward to that day that moment. Um, when you're pulling yourself out of bed from staying up until, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, mixing. That's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, these kind of shows, the majority of uh, the Cirque shows, um, the, the time, the schedule, which is a major thing, uh, gets uh, split into, the, the evenings get split up into different times for projection, lighting and sound. And uh, we'll work separately initially and then work together as time as we all start creating our shapes and during that time um well, we do two nights shall we say and we can work till like uh two three in the mornings and uh we can uh, have the musicians join us as well um uh, here's a uh, an over overhead view of it's really just uh all showing it's not that interesting really except if you um, look on the stage, there's a thrust there and you to see uh, lifts and everything else. Uh, the, um, in the stage, I have uh, 28 speakers pointed up in the air and because the angle, yeah, there they are, because of the angle of them, uh, of the auditorium, uh, the majority of the audience is looking down on the stage. 
So I have a matrix of speakers on the stage where I can fly things around and move things and, and chase things or, uh, and create uh, invisible things. Um, and, to, image, uh, to image the sound to the stage? Yeah, yeah. So, yes. So imagine if you're running, um, but you're not there. You're invisible. Yeah. I can have the, your footsteps running around on the stage, for example. Wow. You know, well, uh, uh, wow, unless it gets cut. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the things that you, you know, you, you, you go along and you try things. And, oh, they're used in many different other ways and stuff like that. But, you know, that was, that was a, a, a nice thing. Uh, I, in fact, I can't even remember if it's, it's there or not. Um, and um, so this is a show we're talking about that hasn't opened yet, but I'm being, uh, making sure that I respect Cirque's, uh, they've done press, they've had press and stuff, so um, not that the press uh, who came are interested in anything to do with uh, sound or music, maybe the music, but certainly not sound, um, which is fine, which is good. Um, I'm not complaining about that, I'm just saying that um, this stuff has not been seen. There's <laughs> probably reasons because it's like, what is this? It's just a bunch of speakers showing the overhead speakers. Oh, it's a little more interesting. So they're looking at a, a section and uh, the stage being to the left, the auditorium being to the right. So you can yeah. see some overhead speakers, some overhead subs. You can see the proscenium speakers, the, uh, the leopards in the proscenium. You can see the 1100s there sitting on top of the leopards the 900s being part of the array. Then there's USWs, UPAs, MSL2s. Those are all left over from the NUBA. I love to reuse uh, systems that, if I'm going into um, a, a theater that has an existing system, I will, I will use it, I will reuse it, no matter what, uh, what the, the, if it can make you noise, I'll use it. But then I'll put it into a place where I'm okay to use that. I, I am not going to just throw anything up as the main PA, but as far as, uh, you know, sound effects and overheads and stuff like this, um, if I can get the coverage, I'll do it. So there it's, it, What's amazing is Lenovo ran for over, what, 20 years probably, right? Yep, yep over 20 years. And, uh, the, spe the existing speakers we sent to be back to be refurbished. They were refurbished, came back, and they were all back in there being used. and it's um, uh, lots of fun. There's some JMs in the center there. Uh, we, it was actually an uh, array initially, but the array got in the way of all the acrobatics. So we had to split and go into JMs. Uh, and this was Brian Shea uh, suggesting, he said, well, you should try and do this. Look, and it, he mapped it for me and everything else, um, which is great. Again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah. Um, and it's listening to everyone um, uh, make it, you, it's you that is making the choice, the sound designer is making the choice and everything else, but you need to listen to everyone, um, it, certainly when everything's on pen to paper. If you're in the middle of mixing uh, something with a band on stage or and, and t and time, especially if you're on Broadway or something, and your time is of an essence, every second counts, um, and you're in the middle of mixing, it's, that's not the time when you're going to be listening to everyone and having a, a kumbaya about the kick drum or something like this. It's like, right. no, let's, you know, so, but the, your initial thoughts and ideas and everything else is, um, it's always good to get other people's, for me, to get other people's point of view. I know what I want. I'm hearing what it sounds like in this room when I look at these pictures. You know, when I look at these pictures, I'm, not because I've been in there, but if I'm somewhere else, Oh, we moved on. So, so that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, keep it going. Keep it going. At your own yeah. pace, Jonathan. I'll, I'll, own just pace. Wither, I'll just wither on, and people go, "Oh my god!" And uh, so, yeah, anyway. The so one thing I have to tell. sorry. The one thing I have to say about your about your uh, associates about your team is that um, they are some of the most talented, amazing uh, people that I've ever met, worked with. I mean, a couple of the names you mentioned, you know, uh, Brian Shea is a phenomenal uh, yeah. associate, right? Programmer, yeah. designer. Jason uh, Rahoff. Jason, Jason Rahoff, yes, I know Jason him well. Rahoff. Awesome. Uh, Daniel Lundberg, I mean, in New York. It, wow. it's, yes, Dan, Daniel uh, worked with me on this. Uh, and uh, yeah. it's the first time we worked together, actually, on this. And it's like, oh, my God, this guy is like, 
It's awesome. It's, it's yeah. a team. I, you know, it's like, what, what can I, what, what can I do? What does Jonathan do? And what does Jonathan, what can't I do? And what will I, what do I want to do? And what, what am I able to do? Are all things that you need to fill in on your, your blank piece of paper um, so that you have a blank piece of paper. You can't have any holes in it or uh, any marks on it. It's, you've got to go in as a team where everything, as much as possible, can be covered by the team. Um, Jaggy Little Pill, just, uh, I just adore this show. This show mm-hmm. is just, uh, I mean, besides the music itself and the music, the orchestration that, um, that uh, Tom Kidd has done uh, and the Diane Paulus director. I just, just everything about it, everything. It's just every individual that we're looking at there is like, their contribution to the show is so impactful in, in performance wise and vocal wise. It's amazing what they are doing. They're singing in corridors and they're all coming out of the surround system for so many cues and it's coming out of it's a very heavy surround show uh, and i use uh, uh the uh ensemble uh, sometimes for um uh when, when 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 it's appropriate they come out of the surrounds and stuff and it's just and they're doing quick changes in the corridors while they're doing all this so it's it's, it's quite amazing um, and yes, there has been many <laughs> an instance in rehearsal where where you hear things come out of the surrounds. You go, "Whoa, you might sorry." Um, this uh, this moment here is you want to know. Uh, it's the yeah. kind of classic thing where um, the, the audience is kind of. I think every audience has stood at the end of this number. Every audience has seen it. Um, a stand innovation. Um, it's just um, just. Uh, it's, it's kind of what you, hopefully what you would want to hear and see and understand the story, this story, and the way it's being used and, and being sung. And uh, Lauren Patton, who, who's, who's amazing, is just, uh, uh, just yeah. uh, fantastic, phenomenal. It's a great role. Great sit, role. It was great uh, to sit with you and, and see a preview of this. And then I also saw it, obviously, in, uh, at ART. Uh, in Boston, um, but the show has the moments too, where you know that I that I can say is that there's there's moments of uh, of just intimacy between you know actors and t- and just speaking to each other, and then there's a rock moment um, with Alanis' music that's just oh uh, crazy and just goes through your bones, and it's a ma- it's a phenomenal phenomenal uh, piece of theater. It's, it was interesting. It was something that uh, it was the approach I did, and this is going to really mess up some of your other questions you're going to ask, but, but I need to say that because you tap, touched on it. And so if I repeat myself as I do all the time, so sorry, everyone. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it was interesting to go from something that had to be so quiet, so tender. And the, 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 I'm not talking musical, I'm just talking speech. Just the, 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 the text, Diablo Cody, who wrote the book, uh, it's just so uh, goes to you know Juno, uh, many other mm-hmm. films, but but d- go just understand what it's about uh, the text and to have that moment where an actor can be on stage and it can be it's a play, it's done as it, you know those moments are a play and being able to go from something that is uh, a play where you want the audience to be I'm leaning forward to be attached to the dialogue as you do when you go and see a play, but then it turns into a rock number. And so you come in and then you, so finding out how to do, for me, uh, finding out how to do that uh, balance of going from something so, uh, uh, shall we say acoustical, it's all, it's not acoustical, but everything that-, uh, that, that Intimate, acoustical, yeah. Acoustical to, as loud as you can get without actually having phantom clothes next door because it's so loud because you're in the theaters, yeah. uh, which is, you know, which started off that way and everything else. And then um, uh, it, it's certainly when I was doing sound checks, uh, uh, but because it, it's fun to have that kind of a welly power uh, or, or, yeah. or to be again, have that feeling of me sitting over a, a balcony listening to a live orchestra at the Royal Opera House, and, but 
kind of simulating that kind of idea in, in a space. Um, it, it was, it was so, so I, I uh, came up with um, uh, t uh, several different systems and how they right, right. use. Um, so uh, yeah, there's, uh, that's, that's me looking extremely tired. Um, yeah, and John and Helen, so that's awesome. Uh, the kind of PA um, for, uh, yeah, and the band, bands on stage. Uh, that's, you know, a whole different way of thinking with the band on stage. Here, the red dots on stage are something that I've been doing over the last, um, I don't know, is it 10 years or something, put in speakers. You can see them in the front of the band there. There's four speakers in the stage not being used in the same way as Drawn to Life. This is for stage monitors. Putting speakers in the floor, uh, most uh, stages, because um, there's automation and stuff, uh, are, have, you know, are so many inches higher than the, the house deck, you've got the show deck. So you can put, there you go, speakers in, and you see. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and so you put uh, speakers in the floor facing upwards, um, through a grill, and you you put them about roughly. You aim to try and put them about six feet apart with a wide dispersion speaker, so uh, conical, um, and so that when you're roughly around six feet high, where your ears are, you're walking around the stage. It's absolutely um, flat. You don't have any. Uh, uh, bumps of gain or anything else. The distribution of sound across the stage is, is very, uh, really kind of awesome, and very special. So that you, a lot of times when you put speakers for stage monitors on the side of the, or, of, you know, on the lighting ladders on the side of the stage, when the actor is coming on stage or going off stage or standing on the side of stage, uh, they're, and they're gonna hear something completely different to when they're on the center of stage or when they're downstage. If you put the speakers in the stage, they don't really hear that much difference. And also, yeah. also, if someone is upstage and someone's downstage and the person upstage can't hear this person downstage, you can turn those up louder for those cue lines or whatever it is that they need. And also you have more control of this, uh, uh, feedback um, with uh, uh, the actors. So it become, and, and you can use them for sound effects. If you then split them up into rows and then actually uh, wire those individually back to your amps or back to your uh, to your point source, uh, your, your source of, of, of amplification. Um, then it become you can then use them how you want. So uh, picking these kind of speakers and everything else is uh, uh, important, and then doing it in a way that is um, uh, will work with the scenic designer, um, but for the performers on stage. They are, they, they just love it. There's never any issues other than you going on stage and, and dealing with harmonies of how they want to hear their vocals in the harmonies when they're standing mm -hmm. next to each other. And they're standing with three, four speakers around each other. And you can actually even play help back. So it's, it's, it's kind of super cool. Um, so uh, yeah, there's uh, the, the the speakers being used. The uh, that's great. Yeah. Um, the uh, UP UP4 XPs are uh, what I'm using there for the vocal system. Right. Uh, you know, I use them for the surround and for the vocal system. Uh, and in fact, on the vocal system, I I attach two together. I put them on top of each other, so it's like a little column. It's not a column, column. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. But one just one. looking wise, and they can sit tight on the on stage side of the array, and it becomes an AB. Um, so if uh, I, uh, again, it's one of those things, and this can you know, uh, many people flag something like this, but found that uh, on uh, trying to do an AB system on the front fills and on the main proscenium area, it actually has some value uh, because doing. Um, Ideally, you know, you do A, B system for the entire system uh, mm -hmm. where the voices are going to go through. Um, but, um, but it's still, there's a great value because as soon as anything starts projecting 
projecting a, a, and advancing into a theater and it hitting all the reflections and balconies and everything else, your face is kind of getting all weird anyway. So um, it really helps that um, being able to uh, have that natural sound coming from the stage. Here, that, that, the front pill there was the slims. Can you just go back to that? Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. interesting thing. So uh, that's a light fixture, not a speaker, but it works in the same way, uh, but obviously on further up stage. The, the slim there, one always has to be careful for those who uh, have not, don't use a lot of front fills or whatever. It, it's very important to when you're doing something with dialogue in to help focus to the performers on stage when you know a, a stage width is 30 to 40 feet wide but you have to be careful that you are not that slim or, or that front fill speaker cannot be below because a lot of times you have especially uh, you know designers and directors sometimes say but can it, it's sticking out, can it be lower? And it's like, no, because if it's doing that, it's gonna just put the, the actor's voice into this person's crutch. And uh, uh, as thrilling as that might be, if it's super loud, um, it really doesn't help any intelligibility. And you've also got to try and get that voice, you know, that has got to go between the shoulders of the people in the front row to the next row. Because you kind of want coverage in the first um, uh, one to three rows of front fills, and the rest of it is just a matter of energy that's coming that you can focus uh, sound on um, when you think of that. You see the 1100s there tucked underneath. Um, and those are also on a foot pedal. Mike Tracy is the uh, front of house Thanks, engineer sir. and Chris Devaney is the backstage. She's the front of house engineer. Um, so there's my A1, A2. Mike Tracy, just stunning. Stunning, just hearing him. Yeah. You know, is just... Uh, so much, so much fun. It's like being on a roller coaster in a good way, in a good mm -hmm. way. You know, so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, you got the surrounds there on that thing. So just, yeah. Um, yeah, look so much there. Look so much. And there you can clearly see the UP4 Slim one over one. Yeah, one over one. The, yeah. yeah. And in fact, what that's, that, what that doesn't show correctly, because I said it's got to be on stage. What we had to do, and this is just dealing with the theater and the box and you know, this theater, there is no room. Actually, the picture in the middle shows a picture that I, it's a, a thing I had to go through um, with showing that um, there is no room to put speakers in this particular theater, especially if you want to do some kind of truss around the uh the senior uh, are you able to zoom in a little to that picture the photograph in the middle um just it has uh, been amazing with this so let's see see if that uh if, if not i can just babble on about it but um what what was um yeah okay just um this is not jagged little pill this is another show um oh um and it, what i had to do was to show what it would look like to our producers, directors, and set designers. Look, this is what it is. This is what has been done in the past. It's not just me doing this. And because, you know, the people sitting over the side here say, well, there's a sight line issue. You've got speakers in the way. And it's like, uh, yeah, but how much and what is the benefit of doing this? So I was not able to put the slims in that kind of uh, vertical uh, sense on stage of here. And I had to put them on the box. So if you can go back, to, you can zoom out again now. So I had to put them on the theater box uh, downwind of, you know, or, or into the auditorium of the arrays. But then that meant that there was nothing that attached it to the, to the stage itself. So I then had to get another pair of slims and put it underneath the arrays. Um, in order to create the proscenium sound, like the two above uh, uh, are part of the uh, uh, proscenium sound. So there is my vocal system. That's what, uh, with the front fills, of course. Um, yeah. that's, that's my vocal system. Um, 
yes, I do have vocal system coming out of vocals coming out of the center cluster as well um, <clears throat> to be able to in the leaners there um, to just fill in as needed. But as far as when you're sitting um, in that front, the major, should we say the king's rows, um, mm -hmm. the, the expensive seats, you're listening to in the dialogue, you're listening to the slims. Um, they are um, just, uh, I love them. I, try, I tried it with a few different other speakers and stuff like this, and uh, uh, slims made it easy, and they're so small and so sweet and so bloody powerful um yeah uh, for for the size and stuff so um I, I i'm not trying to sell up speakers here it's really a concept it's a, it's showing a concept as opposed to yeah. you know, whatever speakers you use sorry maya but whatever you know my sound but whatever speakers you use you use whatever you have but it's you actually have to have some kind of idea of um how you use them, why you use them, what you're going to do. Because obviously when they start singing, well, not obviously when, when you start singing, you ought to know. You might start vocally from your dialogue going in from Slims, but you're going to slowly slip in. The voice is slowly going to slip in to the leaners and to the, the, uh, the leopards at full power. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, as it goes on. It just more and more comes in. But the audience are not aware of the shift of the voice from one set of speakers to another, or one type of speakers to another. So if you're doing something like that, you really have to pay attention to what speakers it is um, that you're using. If you, you know, so if you go think of the idea of drawn to life when we're using speakers from the past, um, they're kind of isolated doing what they need to do. They're not necessarily part of the overall main um, uh, proscenium, main PA, if you like. Sure, um, yeah. The, the thing on Jagged, because the ensemble go from, you know, they go from uh, the surrounds to the proscenium um, to the main uh, arrays um, and everything in between, uh, whatever that may be, but a mixture of, it's really, for me, it was really important that um, the audience are not aware of that. Not to say, oh, you're not aware of this or whatever, it's just because the tonal quality as soon as you start changing tonal quality of something, you then don't hear anymore. It takes you a while to adjust to the new sound. Um, so, yeah. So, there you go. so, you know, one, one of my questions um, uh, regarding your teaching, when you teach sound design, um, what are your stood, what, what are some of the highlights, you know, without giving the class away too much, um, that you teach your students? It, um, it's, it's actually uh, as, uh, one of your questions. A nice segue there, John. Yeah. Very good. You've done this before. Um, the, um, it's not giving away anything. It's sharing. It's sharing. We, it's, there's no, nothing, nothing to give away because you can have all the tools and everything else. And if you don't know how to use a tool then, or, or why you're going to use it, then there's no point. Uh, so there's never anything... Uh, secretive about anything. Um, but uh, things, um, I actually, uh, where we finish off there is the, um, some, <laughs> something I, 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 I have said to probably all of my classes or all of the times I've shared is that you can do bad sound. You can have bad sound. You've got to do, you know, if you're going to go to, to do a production, you can, you can get away with, whatever it is. But if in that production, in that show, if you do something that is better than what you have been doing, something that is a, a, a just kind of cool or interesting, then everyone can look and see the other 99% of the show that you've done and go, this is shit because you've just done something that's good. So you've given them a different reference. So if you're gonna do a, a show, you got to keep the reference of uh, the the quality, if you like, of the intention of the the, the sonic uh, uh, expression the same throughout the show. So, if you're going to do, if you just want to do a quick show and, uh, and, and don't care and everything else like this, um, you just keep it constantly bad. Don't do anything good because as soon as you do something good, you have to bring up the other thing. Now you have to work the rest. 
And then as soon as that happens, then you go, oh, now do this. Now everything. So you have to keep sort of chasing, you're chasing yourself and everything else like that. Uh, I, I actually uh, don't, I, I'm aware that um, some people might want to do that. So that's why I say that. So you can do that. But, you know, uh, I um, uh, choose not to do that. Um, and I'm a, a kind of person um, who, um, I don't know, I've been very lucky and uh, yeah, you have. just uh, been able to get on with this. Uh, other things I'll say to the student is, um, written some things down, uh, be on time, be on time, do not be late. It's really funny. It's, and it's the same, it's, I don't think it's just a student thing. I think it's the same for all of us. And I, you know, I just, uh, yeah, be there early and go get yourself a, a, a drink or not, not a drink drink, but a, a, a coffee, <laughs> maybe get coffee. a drink, you know, Water. Pop, some yeah. acid, pop some acid or something and then go to your meeting, <laughs> see how that goes. But, uh, but just be on time. And uh, for students, I do point out that there's no more weekends, no more evenings, no more family holidays. If you're going to go into this kind of thing, there is, you know, you don't, there's no weekends anymore because you're working. There's no evenings anymore because you're working. There's no family holidays because holidays is when people come and see your shows and stuff. So you're, you're working. And so it's like, oh, my friend's getting married or my, I'm getting married. It's like, okay, but we have a show to do. And we got, you know, we, you know, so um, it's just, it So the reality check of doing sound professionally. <laughs> yeah, and that's for, I think, for all sides of doing uh, live entertainment. This is not just a sound thing. This is for live entertainment. I mean, there are some departments that you, you know, play with that, but we're dealing with something that changes every second, second, second. So it will never be the same from one, unless you're doing just a play with just the same recording at the same level. Um, but when you're doing anything live, it changes every second. So you need to be there every second until everybody's gone and then hopefully you're leaving it if you're not the mixer with someone who uh, uh is doing this what's this say here Put it on the roof. this was this was from bob mccarthy uh it was a uh, a little play a version of playbill that he created um okay. Fiddler on the and top. it has to do with yeah go ahead yeah i thought it was cute because um Fiddler on the console is the story of the man who has the world under his fingertips but can't leave well enough alone and will ultimately yeah. leave you and the PA howling. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's... Uh, so... I, I, I just have to say, it's, um, I, 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 it's a little negative, isn't it? It's a little, a little pissy <laughs> on people who mix because then, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, if that's your world and everything else, then yeah. maybe change your track. Um, so the, the one thing I have to say about you and the reason I was asking you about about teaching is, you know, you when I first met you many years ago, I think you were doing an opera for John for John Adams. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, you had said something to me about imaging that just stuck with me, has stuck with me for my entire you know life since I'm I met sorry. you. Um, and, and I think you were, you know, you were in the early stages of LCS and um, and uh, and imaging was so important to you. And I totally got it at the time. And I think that's something that, you know, you've taught a lot of people as well over the years is how important imaging is in theater right. um, and localizing it to an actor in, you know, not over overtaking it, you know, and it has to do, of course, in opera. Um, and it was also to what we talked about, you know, with, uh, with Jagged and how, how important right. that's been to you and your, in, in what you do. And I think yeah. you've taught that to a lot of others. I think it really matters of someone who's on, first of all, when you've got someone on stage, the idea that you're going to put a tiny little mic on them and trying to reproduce a voice that they have been studying and working with for decades um, and paying huge amounts of money for all their coaches and tuition and stuff. And then you come along with a microphone and say, oh, I'm going to reproduce your voice on this. It's kind of a bit of a joke. So as long as we all know that going into this, but this is how things are done. This is what we have to do. And we're going to do it the best we possibly can. So it's interesting on the, the uh, Nick's, uh, well, I first met John Adams on Nixon in China when I was at the LA Opera uh, working, uh, doing their local sound designer, um, doing different operas there. Um, and I, 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 actually, I guess that's that the, um, 
Death of Klinghoffer goes into that list of Death shows. Of you know, that have, um, but uh, it was very interesting because I was using a, a, a tracking device that I had made up uh, with LCS. I, it's, it's before, uh, I was playing with Max. This is before LCS. What I'm saying is before LCS. So I'd use th this. I was using a, a, a tracking device where I just built blocks on um, um, Max. This is before Max MSP. And uh, I'd had each block would send MIDI out and it would go to a Bose, was it 804? The delay. A, a BSS, I think. BSS, sorry, not Bose, BSS. Yeah. BSS 804, sorry. Sorry, yeah. uh, BSS. Um, sorry, Bose. Um, yes, to a delay in it, and I'd have a rack of delay in it and uh, mm -hmm. split them up. And so it would just send MIDI commands to, to change time and also level depending on where they were. So I'd worked out this kind of network to do this. And uh, it's like, oh, this is kind of cool and everything else. When I was in Lyon, we were in Lyon, and there was, uh, we, I was setting up the system. Uh, There's only two of us that went with the show, Graham Carmichael, um, who was mixing, and myself. And um, we're installing it, and a person, can, a person comes in and says, oh, what, what are you doing? Is it, uh, he was a local guy from uh, the local repetitor, associate conductor for the Lyon, whatever it was, opera there. And um, he said, oh, I've never heard uh, amplification of a voice before in this theater. And I said, so, okay, all right. And so he said, well, why, you know, and it's like, well, it's a concept, you have to talk to Peter Sellers, the director and John Adams and, so, you know, uh, like this, but it's the kind of thing. So, well, it's like, oh, okay. And so while we were doing this and I was set up the matrix in and done the, the, the mapping and everything else, he would sit there and listen in the auditorium to what I was doing. And then on one particular time, this was really interesting. He, he, cause he'd never heard amplification in that theater or on an opera before in that space. So he said, he called me over and I went down and Graham said, are you, are you gonna go? You're gonna go and talk to this guy? Cause he was like <laughs> on about sound and acoustics and everything else and how, you know, the tone moisture and all this stuff. So, um, right. so, uh, so I said, of course not, I'm going to go and talk to him. He said, he, came, he said, you know, I'm listening here and it sounds as if their voice is coming from their shoulder. And I went, yes, uh, <laughs> isn't that great? amazing? Isn't that great? It's like, I said, look, let me just turn it off. And, it, uh, and I said to Graham, I said, can you bypass that? And he turned it off and it, of course the voice is shot to the proscenium. <laughs> Right. And he went, oh, that's terrible. And I said, yeah. And, the, and they came back and I said, okay, so let me see if I can fix that. And so I went up and I change, I, you know, I, I don't change it. If someone says something, I will do play with it. I won't go pretend, oh, you know, um, that's just so old, so yesterday. Uh, just don't do that, in my opinion. Um, and I went and changed it by uh, a couple of, uh, of the units by like a millisecond and his thumb went up and went, yeah, you know, wow. yeah, that's it. It's like, holy shit, people really, you know, people it's like, oh my God, this is definitely, definitely worth looking at. And uh, that's when I met, um, uh, what, uh, AKG had Delta Stereophony and it was, yeah. uh, what's his name, Wolfgang, the, I forgot the Wolfgang name. Wolfgang Honor, Dr. Honor. Yeah. yeah, I went yeah. to meet him in Berlin and yeah. spent a couple of days with him uh, talking about stereo stereophony and showing him what I was attempting to do with uh, uh, what became uh, LCS tracking. Because LCS actually started as a tracking device, uh, amongst other things. And that's mm -hmm. the one thing that it doesn't do right now. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. You know, so, um, but it is it's from that. So, um, anyway. Yeah, that was that kind of little story there. Uh, again, listening to opera and stuff like that is just beautiful, beautiful. And then trying to make amplified sound work with the natural beauty is um, something. Uh, it's it's just it's, it really you have to have such respect for uh, the acoustics and for the different rooms that you go into and how it works yeah. in the rooms, uh, including your sound system, how that works. And so, um, yeah, that's nice um, to do. Um, uh, so, 
Can, do can, we want to start doing questions? Sure. Yeah. Unless we exactly. missed something. Okay, I've got covered. pages here I could carry on talking about, but of course. Oh, uh, no. Okay. We can keep going. No, 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 no. I, I think it would be nice to actually see if there's some questions. Um, you can, uh, yes, why don't you show the uh, PY1 thing for a second? Sure. Just as something a little different um, that might trigger some questions. Um, PY1 was a company called Moon Rouge, and uh, there, were, there were two pyramids that uh, were built last year. Uh, put in Montreal, um, and uh, we did a performance. If you flip through a couple of these things, uh, not yeah, that's jagged. So uh, yeah, so yeah, this is kind of good representation, probably because it's a photo of what it. Yeah, it's a photo of of these people going in. Um, carry on. Oh, yeah, the design, this right? The in, drawing. This, this is when you're inside. In, inside, this is what was going on. It was projection all around. Uh, and then we had um, uh, pieces that would come out of the ceiling and um, what we call it kinetic thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Kinetic yeah. sculptures? Yeah. yeah, just come out and do all these amazing things. And there were speakers. Uh, we'll take some quick flap, flip over to speakers. Oh, guess what? They're in the floor. Because it was fun because when it was nightclub, it, in, in the evening, it would turn it into a nightclub. And so the speakers in the floor, super fun for a nightclub. Um, as were uh, the uh, huge amount of 1100s that we had for the nightclub. Uh, that's the small tent going into a tunnel. In the tunnel, I had a thing. The show was called Through the Echoes. And so when you go in there, I just made a max patch. Uh, in fact, I had a max patch made for me. Um, which I wanted it uh, to be able to, when someone spoke, it would, their voice would bounce around the tunnel as you go in. Um, and this is inside, it kind of give, gives you one view, one side view of uh, uh, speakers, which were UPQs. Um, the, everything was behind the screens. So um, you couldn't see anything. They were um, above doorways, behind screens, in the floor, etc. And actually the floor speakers, if you zoom in, this was really interesting because I'm going to put. I see them, yeah. Uh, and then if um, well, there is another. It's the. It's not that. Go back to the other one if you can. Um, just because it. Sh I'm not sure. I give you the angle. But if you look at the floor speakers there, see if you can see that, or if you, you're able yeah, to I see. zoom in. There we yeah, go. You'll see that they're at an angle, um, and they're at an angle. Uh, they're juniors, UP juniors. Um, they're going that way, but they're hitting uh, masonite, which is then directing them to go straight up out of the hole. Because mm. the first thing I did when I come to do the uh, uh, to to do that is like nightclub. Okay, so if you're going to throw up or spill drinks, it's going to go into your speakers. So I had to work out a little thing where uh, liquid could, shall we say, could pass through the grill land on the uh, reflective device, uh, which reflective is masonite, device, like masonite um, yeah. and drop in, uh, in, in under the ground and, and miss the uh, actual speaker itself. So uh, it worked pretty good, everyone. It's a good thing to try. No secrets. Here we go. You know, a, you, you, someone, says, someone says no, then work out a way of, you know, find out why, and then work out a way to make it yes. Um, so that was <laughs> that. Uh, secret to your career. Yeah, yeah, no secrets. You just, well, it's like, you know, because everyone, it, it, well, the thing is, you don't want to say no. That's why I was yes right. because you know, I never wanted to say no to anyone about what I can do with the sound system or what I can't do. But I realized then at the end of the time, it was pretty, the person I didn't want to say no to was myself. So mm -hmm. there's different layers of no. Um, there is, you see, these are different ideas of um, the, the layout of the nightclub uh, on one side of the club floor plan and the, um, the show plan. Um, so um, it was super cool, such an amazing uh, experience um, to be able to do this. Um, Loon Rouge is owned by um, uh, Guy La Liberty. Uh, when he left uh, his ownership of uh, Cirque, when he um, uh, he went off and start, he started, um, some years later, started um, Lou Rouge. 
uh, and this was one of the projects that they uh, he wanted to try out. Um, so there is Gila Liberty. So um, again, um, you can imagine you're doing a basically, if you like, a sonar lumiere kind of a sound and light show and projection, of course, and lasers. I mean, yeah, I, was, I nearly gave you some uh, uh, movie files of the laser shows that go inside. That was incredible, incredible laser shows. You know, it's just um, inside. It was just such a, a amazing experience. Anyways, questions. Yeah. Uh, any, any, so anybody have a question? Um, uh, Jonathan will take it. Merlin will read it. Um, well, while while the chat is warming up, I have one question, which is which, which has been kind of a recurring question uh, the entire week when we talked about theater sound, which is uh, is the noise floor. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Noise floor is, uh, there are three things that one has to deal with uh, when, or, 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 or comes under, not deal with, that, that falls under your umbrella as a sound designer um, or as anyone to do sound or as an audience member. And that is uh, the music, the vocal or the text, because um, it could be singing, it could be spoken word, and the noise. So those three things are all part of it. And then whether you are inside a big top doing a circ show and the kind of noise that's generated inside of that to whether you're just dealing with um, HVAC systems or, or uh, projection or lighting systems, etc., cetera. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's funny and in a lot of those circumstances um, when you go into the theater is to do with cost of, how much, and we've got the theater itself with the HVAC system um, of, of what is acceptable. Because as soon as you have a noise floor, and so, you know, if you have this image of whatever, you, if you guys are looking at what I'm sitting in, you know, and so, you know, we, we have, you know, the noise, regular, my noise floor here is like down here, you know? So if you go into the theater and you have HVA system and everything else, your noise floor might be here. So your dynamics are left from here to here. And then if you've got moving lights and projection and you haven't been able to put the projection into enclosures or the moving lights, which are many moving lights now that don't actually create noise, um, and you haven't been able to make that, uh, not the sound designer, but the production hasn't been able to make that affordable or for whatever reasons it's not there, your noise floor goes here. So now there's your dynamics. So now all your dialogue starts here. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different thing than this. So reducing the dynamics. Um, so you have to um, uh, uh, work at that collaboration of, of working with things and, and seeing the point of no return. Um, I have managed to go in a couple of times to theaters and, and, and uh, but uh, when I go and approach a theater and say, you know, whether it's uh, Schubert's Needlanders or, or Jensen or, what um, I'm not going to approach them on my own. I can't. I have to do it with my director. Right. Of, so that it becomes, you have to have the power of something other than the sound designer or the sound team saying, this is ridiculous. You have right. to do, you have to go to that it, uh, and, and put forward your thing. So it, again, it's the collaboration, it's the team understanding what it is. Now, if you're going to go and do, uh, I never saw Rock of Ages, but I'm sure Rock of Ages was just a loud kind of retro 60, 70, 80 80s musical. Um, uh, I don't know if there was dialogue in, in it or whatever, or when there wasn't any music, but it may be, you know, things There's like that. Dialogue, yeah. the, the noise flow is not so important because you're up here and your dynamics is here as well. It's just a matter of how you pick out uh, your, your instrumentation and everything else like this. Although when I say that, I'm thinking of, you know, if I'm doing Emerson Lake of Palmer and I'm going to do some really nice, beautiful uh, guitar stuff, I want my noise floor to be down here. So I've just kind of just gone back on what I just said there. Um, so um, it, 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 it is important, but you have to look at, um, you can't just approach it as a sound, as a solo sound person um, or, or a solo team. It has to be understood by the uh, director um, so that that can be pushed forward to the producers and can be had a conversation. 
uh, but other times when you're in a big top and you're uh, and it's just the outside or the fact that you're inside a canvas shell of what that noise is and when it's freezing and they have to turn on the uh, air blowers um, it's looking at it and making that noise part of the production of actually working with it don't work against it so um, it varies but um, uh, yeah that is uh, it's always a concern and the designers most of the designers all the designers I've worked with know that that's the first question I'm asking about that and now we'll do it in a general meeting um, so that it's head out there it's not a one-to-one -one meeting it's a general meeting because there's more power to us when everybody can hear so that when <laughs> when you're doing a note session after a performance or after a preview and you're all sitting in the auditorium and the first thing, not the first thing that happens, but when you're all sitting and you start talking, the head electrician is turning off all the, uh, uh, the power to the theater. So you're turning off HVAC, you're turning off uh, all the projection, all the lights and it, it, even amplifiers if you've got amplifiers in the wrong place. Um, you suddenly hear, Every, everyone's shoulders like this down. And you're doing this and, and it's like and it suddenly goes and it's like defeat, def, deflating a balloon with a, except without the, that noise uh, it just goes it's just like oh my god did I just take something it's like oh it's so <laughs> relaxed and you can talk better and have a right. better conversation you go oh wouldn't this be nice if an audience could hear this so you, yeah you mentioned the big top which makes me think of rain I mean, a tent is, of course, with respect to rain. Oh, beautiful. Is a unique rain in a big rain and a big top is beautiful. Of course, one can't. I mean, it would be great to put that into the show and then have you know be able to have you know hoses come at the time to create that sound. It's such an amazing sound. It's such an amazing sound in there, and that's just uh, it's just enjoying the the beauty of the fact that we're in a tent. You know, it's it's when you get into um, the, 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 the constant sound or the surround, how you deal with the surround system. It's like, mm -hmm. no, point, it at, point the speakers at the canvas, and use the whole canvas as your surround uh, resonator, not just this little thing hanging there because it's little because of the weight and the load on the tent and all this. No, point it at there right. and crank it up more constantly and reflect it at the it's just a bit, bit like my speakers in the floor if you like you know use use the objects around to create Fuse it a bit yeah you know you're not trying to create a point source but even then yeah. that's like another conversation so uh, we we have a question from uh, christopher dean in the chat and he's wondering who makes the decision as where the band is located pit versus stage uh the uh the director the writers um that is uh in a general sense um with like jagged pill bands on stage we want to see the band it's it's using alanis morissette's music or not using or, 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 or um uh, 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 performing her music um the uh waitress that was on stage um the when you have a show like pippin it's more of a classic show or you know, it, you know it, it depends on the style, but it comes from the production. It's not the sound person choosing where it is. Now, the sound person, especially if you're, uh, you're with a collaborative team, can go forward and say, like, I'm, work, I'm doing a production 1776. 1776 is a classic show, revival, band in the pit, one of those things. No, our band is on stage. It's a choice from the director of what they want, and then the way that it's being scored and the way it's being, uh, 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 not scored, but uh, uh, orchestrations are being written. It's kind of, it's a, a different look and different, it's being approached differently uh, in many aspects, not just that. So it makes total sense. Now, where the band is placed and how the band is, the locations of the band and what, if you're on different levels, what should be upstairs, what should be down? Oh, yes, yes, you have a big say in that because there's a lot of things that won't work um, in, um, in someone's idea of, oh, we'll just put them here and here and here. No, 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 it's, it's very involved and it's coming. Where the drummer goes? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, Chris? Um, 
please make use of the chat if you have any other questions. Um, so Christoph, Christopher follows up with uh, a question. How does the location of the band affect your microphone choice? Uh, big time, big time. Depends on the kind of band. Uh, if it's um, uh, uh, orchestral, I mean, it's microphone choice. It's microphone choice in two ways, the band microphones and also the, um, not, but not too much for me, the band microphones, but as far as the stage microphones and the kind of, it's the context of the music, the type of music and what's needed. When you put a band on stage, if you're doing a rock show or show that is pop or high energy, and you know that you need that, that energy to come from the musicians to create that sound, then I'm really going to be looking at, okay, how are the performers hearing? Now it's not that you say, well, it's because there's a band behind, but that's not the mix. That's just relative, you know, you're not gonna hear necessarily hear the keyboard come out. Or are you putting a speaker where the keyboard is in the in the platform, perhaps, which I do all the time, um, to so that the sound of the uh, keyboard actually comes from where the keyboard is, and so it's creating a point source along with the, the strings and everything else. Uh, uh, same with guitars, you put speakers, you know, it's like if you have an electronic, uh, if you've got electric guitars and you're playing with a Kemper or a Fractal, and so everything is going to come from the PA and nothing's coming from stage. Now, if you have guitars on stage and they want to bring in on their amps and they're putting something in there, whoa, 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 whoa flag, 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 Me, you know, uh, but I need this guitar amp sound, it's, it's my thing and everything, it's my jam. So it's like, absolutely, totally agree with you take that amplifier and put it somewhere off stage, out of reach. Uh, because, um, not because of the player, there is sometimes to dealing with that, of they can adjust their amplifier and completely kill everyone on stage. If there's a, a guitar on, on stage uh, uh, and you, you're trying to do microphones, you know, uh, lav mics on, on people's yeah. heads or behind their ears or wherever else, um, the, um, it, it matters greatly. So, but it's also when it gets knocked and when it gets knocked by uh, a stage crew or by an actor or, or something, it's just very vulnerable. You don't want to do that. It's like you don't want to do, if you use in some kind of self-powered speaker on the side stage monitors or whatever, if you're doing that, if you take like an anchor or something, you turn it up all the way. You know, it's got to be full all the way. So all that can happen is it can turn down. You never leave saying, oh, about 50% is about right for my offstage monitors, because suddenly that's going to end up full. I mean, they can turn it off, but that's up to them. But turning it up, you can be disastrous. So it matters a lot. Uh, what makes you decide on actors, uh, lab or on the forehead? Can I answer that one? By all means. Yeah, it's all yeah. yours. Okay, so uh, d d d does everyone get to see this chat? Uh, uh, they open the they chat. can, but I, just to make sure they're on the same page, what makes you decide on the mic for actors? Boom mic versus lav mic on the forehead. Okay, so um, if I had the choice, I'd have a Neumann U87 hanging from the person's head, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, the size of... <laughs> the rubber band. You know, it's like, I would have this hanging like this, and this is where this would be, like a studio mic. Because... You know, it's like, that's what would be sound, as opposed to, you know, the tiny little fingernail and everything else. So that's, that's where I mentally start from. <laughs> I start from there. And it, then um, there is, it depends on the production itself. I, I do like using the boom mics on, on, for performance, but it's very hard having someone, uh, 1776, uh, which is more, uh, they're, they're, you know, in, in their period costumes, to have a boom mic, uh, it doesn't kind of work. And, and it's like, whatever. If you're going to do a, a production, maybe like six, I'm, I haven't seen six, but six is a production that is about the six wives of Henry VIII and everything else. I would say I'll do, because it's a, a, a pop show. You know, it's all pop music and stuff like this. Oh, you've got to use, head, you know, this mic. You wouldn't use this mic because are they in Elizabethan costumes? I don't know. Is it kind of sexy version of those? Either way, they were kind of sexy anyway. So, so whatever, you know, and, and you know, if, if Henry VIII is involved, sure, if he's going to come out and sing a pop song, you know, do this. So right. it's the style of thing. But the, 
there is times when you have a situation where I need to do this. I've got a band on stage and I have this. It's the kind of music, the kind of director, and sometimes the directors say, no, absolutely not, you cannot do this. Um, and so you can, it's, 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 it's creating and, and making sure that you have laid everything out of the pros and cons of doing this, which have to include the visual res responsibility you have to the production, to the costumes, to the scenic elements, to the actors themselves. Of course, you can pull the microphone down and they can look as if they have had a lobotomy with a long cable going down and stuff like this and get it closer, uh, it, you know, if you really have to. But then it also depends on who the actor is, what they're going to sing, how they're going to sing, and how they can continually uh, produce. If you've got an actor who's got a beard, sure, you can put, whether it's a lav mic in the beard or a head mic, you know. So it's, it's looking at that, but uh, a Neumann U87 in front of the face is where you should start. <laughs> <laughs> and just pull back from there. Yeah, pull back from there. It's also pretty expensive, but yeah. <laughs> so, so we have a question of uh, Josh. Josh is wondering, um, he loves to hear about your collaboration with composers uh, for new works. What are some of the challenges? Um, the, uh, for, for, for new works, well, there's, first of all, it's, uh, the first thing you have to find, find out is why are the composers, why are you doing the show? Why are you doing the performance or, or the opera or whatever it is? Why have they chosen you? And then understanding that if it's just because you happen to be there or you happen to be some of them, this, that's a different kind of relationship you're going to have with a composer than a composer that has actually chosen you or has heard about you or has seen something that you've done because then you have an immediate communication. The communication is really important. Uh, a, a, a composer, um, if I'm uh, a, a composer or an arranger comp uh, who is arranging uh, existing compositions, whether it be Jagged Little Pill or whether it be- uh, it, right. Yeah, uh, or, or whether it be Benoit uh, Jutra, who is right, com composing you, or whether it's John Adams in the opera and everything else, <laughs> the connection that I will make to them is really, really strong and really um, uh, important. If you don't have the collaboration, you are screwed. If you don't have the understanding and the support, you, it's, it's, you, it's going to be a miserable production for you. Um, because they're the ones who've got it in their head. They've heard it and they know what it sounds like before they've even started talking to you. They know it's all inside that. It's, it, it, anyone who's you know, dealing with music in that way, actually before they've even written it down, they've probably heard it. Um, so to be able to be allowed into the brain or mm -hmm. into that creative part of their brain where uh, and understanding what that is. And then you get to the point where they understand, they understand that you understand that, that you're not just um, uh, just uh, utility mixer. I have, don't care about utility mixing, or utility mixing and basic mixing, just thing of making it loud or quiet. I have no interest in doing any productions that treat sound as a utility. Um, so, it's very, uh, very involved and, I'm, uh, uh, and because I, uh, all of my design, um, all of my designs are, uh, are different. I don't ever copy my own designs. Um, I, I think sometimes my wife uh, wishes that I did because then it'd be a lot easier. Uh, she, uh, uh, it'd be a lot, uh, 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 but it, it doesn't work like that. It can't work like that for me. In the same way as a, a composer, a ranger, um, the, uh, it's really important to do that. So, because then you can say, hey, can I try this? And they go, yeah, sure. There's a trust. There's a trust that right. you've done. There's a creative trust. And if they go, oh, shit, that's terrible. I mean, uh, actually, uh, uh, Tom, Tom Kitt was brilliant on, on uh, Jack Little Pill. So he said, sure, go, go do your thing. Go, go try it. Go do it. And then a couple of times it would be like, no, or the director would go, what is that? I was like, something I'm trying. She said, 
good. Just as long as you're just trying, you know. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and just so so fantastic the conversations. Uh, and, 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 honestly, and and Benoit would be uh, would just leave me alone to mix his stuff, and then when I've mixed it, would come in and, and listen to what I've done, and then go, uh, cool, great, everything else, but. I'm, I need this and this and this and this and this. And you go, oh, that's good. Well, I was doing this day. So they said, no. And then you start sharing each other's sonic stories about their composition or their work wow. and what that means to you and your experience that you've had. So it's, it's on equal terms, on equal give and take, understanding that their music, you wouldn't be there without their music or without their arrangements. So understand that, yes, they always have the upper hand, but you need to be able to do something, to be creative. Otherwise, it's utility and you might as well just go home and let someone else do it. Yeah, that's a great question, Josh. Thank you. Interesting. As you were talking about a microphone selection, I had to think of something which was brought up during another uh, webinar earlier this week, which is that um, it's been suggested that sound reinforcement has actually made it possible for composers and arrangers to come up with arrangements which otherwise would not be possible through acoustic transmission alone. Yeah. And, and of course, this also then has an effect on your microphone choice. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it goes further than that because it's also the staging, the choreography and the director, uh, the, 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 the actual staging of the actor, whether they're standing upstage, downstage or whatever, or if you, they're just sat at the, you know, you can do the, um, uh, uh, what's the name? Um, is it, who? I can't remember, you know, there is performers who would walk to the front of the stage and belt a song and they belt a song and, and, and that would be it. And then they go off and everything else. No, the, those times have changed and everything else. Had Lupone? No? no? No, no, not Paddy. <laughs> long, long, long before. No, um, but it, it, it's, um, um, it, 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 it really does, it, the, the, the kind of direction and what is expected um, is this, but what happens then is that you still have to make it believable to the audience of their location, of where they are on stage, and also the scenery. Um, you can have mm -hmm. scenery that actually reflects into the audience, so it becomes like an orchestra shell uh, into the audience. And those can be good things and those can be bad things. So you have to understand what the scenery is doing, what, what it's blocking off, whether it's stage monitors or whether it's the actor's voice, whether it's an open or whether it's drapes or how much is hanging above, all these things take into account of, you know, if it's drapes hanging above, that's good because it just kills the grid, uh, you know, all those things. But those are things that when you walk in, certainly when you walk into the theater and the scenery is there, you should, even though you've seen it on papers and you might have talked about it, uh, drawings and stuff, you need to go in the theater and just understand what it feels like and what it sounds like in that yeah. space. Yes, it's different for touring, because touring is in, out, uh, they're there for a week, two weeks or whatever, and it's not unless you've got a sit down show that you're actually gonna take all that into account because it's gonna be taken out every week. You know, the, you don't even, as a designer, you don't even travel with a touring show. It's just your A1 and A2 people that, uh, that go out and do their, their thing and hopefully represent the work that you've done in the best way that they can in sometimes uh, uh, an auditorium that was built for an, uh, um, an orchestra and, um, and that they realize now that the, the way that they make revenue is by doing, putting it on the touring thing, you have musicals coming in. And so they'll put a musical into a, uh, an orchestral house and then they, then they work out, well, why can't we understand? Why can't we get, can't hear anything? Because of the reverberation time, two point something. And it's like, right. just insane and ridiculous. Really, you can't work this out for yourself? <laughs> it's like, you should have thought about this on day one when you were trying to put this stuff together. Oh, I know that guy. Yes, so. <laughs> this has been amazing, Jonathan. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, this, is, this has been a really, really great day. Thanks for some of you who held on there. You still participated in this. So, so bless your hearts. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and yeah, let's uh, hopefully we'll be back at work and doing our things uh, uh, soon. And uh, yeah.
from around from see me. We, we, so we will. It, it, it'll happen. Yeah. I don't mean you. I don't okay. want you to come see me. I'm talking about the other people on here, the other <laughs> group. Okay. All right. All right, Merlin. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, much appreciated. Super interesting. Um, I would also very much like to uh, genuinely thank my co-host this week, John Minito. Uh, John Minito has been pulling these three webinars on Theater Sound. Much, much appreciated, John. I hope that it will not be the last co collaboration when it comes to webinars. And that means... It, it won't. <laughs> awesome. Very much looking forward to continue that. Um, and that means that, as always, a recording of today's webinar can be found within the next couple of hours on our Thinking Sound uh, YouTube channel. Um, today, we're going to announce our intent for the summer uh, starting uh, this Monday. So be sure to uh, pay attention to our social media and uh, newsletters uh, where we're going to disclose what we have in mind for you for the uh, upcoming weeks during the summer. And that means that without further ado, uh, please stay healthy, please stay safe, please stay secure, and best to you and your loved ones. Hopefully see you on Monday. Happy weekend. Bye-bye.